and uh, we are managing 21 programs, but by the end of 23 will be 30, because nine programs are being integrated in Oka. This means that in the last years, in the last three years actually, Oka is growing asymptotically. And uh, uh, we are, as you can imagine, there is a big pride for that. So I am always happy to talk to the people, because when I arrived in Oka, I realized that there very few people that knew what Oka was. Everywhere, also in the parliaments where I went, they did not know what Oka was. But Oka is an instrument. Is a tool, a great tool that the nations have to foster the cooperation. Because cooperation is a fundamental, particularly in this European environment. Cooperation means working together. Cooperation means avoiding duplication of efforts and fragmentations that we have a lot in Europe. We always talk about European defense. European defense is a very nice word, but the question is, do we have the European defense? Well, I think we don't, at least yet. So, something must be done. And to do that, the word cooperation is the key word. I always say that uh, our motto that I invented by chance is uh, cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. The first cooperation is uh, among the, the nations. The politicians have to understand that cooperation is fundamental. And then, in the nation, the industries they have to cooperate with each other. If the industries do not cooperate, we go nowhere. We will still have some nations that do things and other nations that not do things. So we have to buy them off the shelf. And the third one is among the uh, organizations. In Europe today we have uh, OCA and we have EDA, EDA, European Defense Agency, but the European Defense Agency doesn't, agency does not manage complex problems. They do research and development, research, technological research actually. And then there is NSPA. And SPA does a wonderful job in the theater. They don't manage the programs like we do. But uh, why they get the politicians have to foster, have to influence the industry and not vice versa as it happens to do the cooperation? Because if you think about assets in Europe, we have uh, big duplications, and I'm referring to uh, ships. For example, frigates, I'm from the Navy, so it's uh, easier for me to talk about that. Every nation in Europe has their own frigate. The ones who are able to do it, the other, they buy. Raiders, everybody is a raider, so they have big duplications, because they don't cooperate with each other, the industries. Fighters, this is uh, fantastic to think about, because uh, today in Europe are being developed two different fighters. One is among France, Germany, and Spain, so-called EFCAS. The other one is Tempest, is being developed by Italy, UK, and now Japan. Do you have any idea how much the development and production of one fighter costs, the forecast is uh, between 150 and 200 billion euros. To do two of them, uh, about 400 billion euros. This uh, is uh, uh, Europe able to develop two of them. US develop, develops only one. US has much more money than us. But continuing with this uh, duplication and fragmentation, Really, our uh, technological base is not growing, will not grow. To give you another number, which is important, is that Europe as all spends half of the 
US budget. The efficiency is one tenth. Is that because the Americans are better in uh, developing things? I don't think so. I worked a long time with the, with the, the Americans. The problem is that if they do a frigate, they just develop one frigate and they build 60, 70 frigates. But the development is one. If they do a regular, then they buy 200 layers, but the development is one. In, uh, in Europe, we do several uh, developments. And this, uh, the consequence of this is that the European industries, they compete with each other. So when we go abroad uh, as Europe, we find Naval Group and Fink and Dairy uh, challenging each other. Thales, Leonardo, Enzo, they challenge each other. But the, the, the main purpose of the European defense is to create the industrial base of Europe to compete with the external entities, US, Korea, uh, China. But today we are you know, convicted, convicted to lose because our prices will not be good enough to compete with these big, big industries. So, as you uh, can, can, can imagine, uh, as Ocar, I struggle a lot with the nations trying to, to put them together. But can you imagine that uh, Thales, Lorenzo, or Leonardo, they renounce to their development to compete, to uh, uh, cooperate with each other? I don't think so, unless the politicians the European ministers, for example, they force the industry to cooperate with each other. I want to give you another example, which is very indicative. You know the ships, or the Horizon ships? Yeah? The Horizon ships was a French Italian competition. That was a real competition. They built four ships that were almost identical. When I say almost identical, it's because uh, you have some national alliance, which is okay. It's not a problem. The nations can have different units. It depends where you work, the environment, and so forth. So it's, uh, the national alliance are, uh, are okay. But now that we have uh, in, the, in the middle of the middle of upper range of those ships, the Italian industry and the French industry, they are fighting each other to put their own radars. Which means that the great cooperation is diverging incredibly. So this is uh, the, this is the real point. Now Ocar is Ocar uh, is able to keep this together, but Ocar alone cannot do anything because Ocar is owned by some nations, some European nations, particularly plus the UK. But we consider the UK still European, at least geographically speaking. So, uh, the problem is to, uh, to work together. The problem is that they must do things once and not twice or ten times if we have ten nations. And it is in the Commission, the European Commission decided to foster this cooperation because we understand, everybody understands that the cooperation is not good to save money, to spend less for more and not to spend more for less as it happens today. So they put some money in the air, for example, but before the, the IDP. But uh, what I am uh, looking at this uh, situation is uh, that all you know, the, the interested nations, they try to get this money for their own uh, development. And this is against the spirit of uh, the European Commission. So there is a lot to work. There is a lot of work, and uh, uh, I think that nothing can be done. This morning I was talking to uh, the Minister of Defense of, of Greece, and he agreed with me, but it's easy to agree with me, because uh, if, we want, if, if we want to do things together, we have, we have to do things together, which means that someone, some nations, have to step back a little bit and uh, to allow the uh, weaker nations to step forward. 
in order to create an industrial base in Europe where the land will be settled. And O'Connor, for this, uh, uh, the fathers of the convention, they invented a fantastic uh, work, global boundaries work. Uh, you know that uh, usually when uh, there's a cooperation and uh, the nations put money uh, for a certain program, they spend X euro and they expect X work one to one. No matter if uh, that uh, X is painting or is making screws or bolts, the global balance is a fantastic invention because they say everybody has to do the best they can do. Therefore, if uh, you put X money and you get less than X as work well for something that you are not able to do a great job as the other, that's fine because you can recall that the delta of work that is not uh, given to you through other problems in multi years. So at the end, the balance should be zero. Does this happen in Noka? Not yet, for the same reason I said before. So we have some nations that have global balance very negative, and some that have uh, some other nations that have a uh, very positive global balance. So uh, the, I am here just uh, to inform you about what happened and to tell you that uh, in, for sure, we have an organization able to manage programs, able to control the global balance, able to deliver in time, in cost, and in performance. These, uh, all these things are under the control of the nations that participate to the program. But this is fundamental. How we do that? We do that because our organization is very flexible. As uh, Morello was saying, what well, was saying before, uh, I was the director of the Naval Armament in, in Italy. And uh, in order to get a, an approval or a decision from the big, the big weeks, sometimes it took months, in order to get an urgent decision from me, it takes one day. If it's not urgent, maybe one week, 10 days which is nothing to compare to what happened in the national administrations. So this is uh, uh, the message that I, I, want, I want to give to you. Um, I think and I hope that after our discussion, we will have questions from everyone and any kind of question we need to answer to all of you. So this is in, you know, in a very concise way what we do in our country. Thank you. Very much, Edmond. Um, we will come to you with questions later on in the panel discussion. Um, and next in line for our, uh, our panel is um, Dr. Thanos Dobos. And I have to make a confession here. Uh, my three children are very jealous of me because they watch every movie of the Marvel Universe. And you know what I'm hinting at. And my two sons said, ah, oh, are you going to moderate Thanos? You have to watch out for his fist. <laughs> so that's, um, that's what I'm going to do. Um, I hope that uh, doesn't exclude you from uh, delivering some punchlines to us, if you forgive uh, the pun. Um, but who is this Thanos? Thanos Thomas. He is an academic and think tanker. Uh, and this is what Rada told me, so it must be true. For much of his professional life. And he has worked in the Hellenic Ministries of National Defense and Foreign Affairs. And he is currently the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister of Greece. A challenging job indeed, I think. Can I give you the floor, please? Well, thank you, and, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Um, my, my own three sons are also um, watching the Marvel Universe. That makes it three plus three plus myself at seven already um, enjoying this. Um, we, um, we are witnessing, and, and I apologize for saying something so obvious, that the uh, 
security environment is changing, and I guess most of us are struggling to understand um, what the broader region will look like once the, the task has, uh, has cleared. Um, talking about the Mediterranean, uh, we haven't seen such a high concentration of naval power since the, the days of the, of the Cold War. Um, and, and Ukraine, the war in Ukraine has already affected uh, our thinking in, in terms of land warfare. A bit less, I think, when it comes to air, and even less, at least for the time being, uh, when it comes to naval warfare. But there is one preliminary conclusion already uh, more than warships remain vulnerable to guided munitions, which we knew that already. And, and probably to UAVs and USBs, um, whose use is, is uh, gradually increasing by an increasing number of, of players. So it's no longer uh, just a few countries that have that capability. And this is an interesting trend. I will come back later uh, with another sentence on this. But talking about the maritime security environment, it's of course. Um, the impact of Ukraine has been felt uh, in the north, uh, the Baltic Sea, the North Sea, then uh, further south, the Black Sea, and also the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, we already have a number of uh, hotspots and existing uh, naval missions like Unifil, there is Operation Irini uh, in Libya, um, there is Operation Sea Guardian, uh, which is a NATO operation. And, and we have uh, a, the presence of, of warships by, by several countries, most of them coming from the region, but then also the usual suspects, the US, Russia, and we get a, an occasional Chinese or even Indian uh, ship every, every now and then. Um, so th this is becoming increasingly complex, and we have all kind of needs and missions, uh, some of the obvious traditional ones, but then also um, flows of population flows, uh, irregular migration, and organized crime, terrorism, um, also the need to protect um, offshore platforms for hydrocarbons, or to manage crisis because of um, Drilling ships. Um, now, to um, a, a brief reference to what Europe is, is doing or not doing, uh, and to echo the Admiral, uh, we have had recently our own experience about the fragmentation of European defense industry. We had our uh, program uh, for procuring a, uh, a frigate with their defense capabilities. There were seven uh, bids, six of them coming from uh, European countries. And there are probably a couple of others who didn't um, participate in, in the tender. And, and that's unacceptable, obviously. Uh, we need to increase our competitiveness. We need to consolidate that defense industry. Uh, otherwise, you know, we are uh, yet behind uh, even more than that makes the situation today. So this should be a priority for you. I, one can understand and even sympathize with other national priorities, but if we don't work together, then we we'll simply not be competitive. Um, coming to Greece, uh, I uh, we probably, when it comes to, to naval um, capabilities, we uh, lost a full decade because of the economic crisis. We are now trying to catch up, uh, and we have a dynamic uh, procurement program, including frigates, corvettes, uh, modernization of ships, uh, increasing you know, um, uh, the uh, availability of funds for maintenance, uh, and then soon our, our future priorities will include also uh, the modernization of submarines, uh, and, and fast patrol boats and, and other um, ships of the fleet. 
Uh, let, let me say here, I'm a strong believer in unmanned vehicles. I think this is part of the future. So uh, Greece will, uh, along with everybody else, I suppose, will be challenged to find the right mix of forces for the future. And this is an area where we need to invest uh, nationally or even better working with our European allies when it comes to the U.S. Now, um, talking about our own modernization program, um, I would have preferred to be able to say that this is only about fulfilling our uh, international obligations in the context of the UN, NATO, and the EU. Uh, it's, uh, it's much more complicated. There are many other urgent national needs, uh, including, of course, the protection of our um, maritime borders, from uh, irregular migration, organized crime, and terrorism, but of course, I, I don't even need to explain why we need a, a strong Navy. It, it's also, of course, if one takes a look at the map, it's obvious why in a country like Greece we need a strong Navy, and this is uh, heavily emphasized in our uh, national security strategy, which has been approved by the government and will be published in the next uh, couple of weeks, I hope. Um, now, um, as I mentioned, the first decision, first choice has been made. Uh, we bought three FDI frigates from France. Now, um, there was also a decision by uh, the relevant authorities uh, to modernize our MECO uh, frigates, all four of them. Uh, in the same configuration. And the next decision, which uh, hopefully will be uh, taken before the end of the year, uh, will be about uh, four corvettes. Um, now, it's it's a strong priority for us to have uh, three of them being built in Greek shipyards. Um, and it's also, um, and I have send that message on a very regular basis to all interested um, parties that uh, local investor participation is, is a very important criterion for the final decision. Uh, and the, the ambition, and here I have to say, um, there's a collective responsibility of, of, of governments over the past for more than 20 years about the uh, full shape of our shipbuilding industry. Uh, mistakes, mistakes have been made in the past. Not much we can do about that, but now this, uh, this is another urgent priority, and hopefully <coughs> within the next 12 months, we'll have two functioning large shipyards, Karamanga and Eleusis, which will be able uh, to uh, participate in, uh, in military programs, but also, and that's the hope, they will take jobs uh, by the, uh, our merchant fleet. Um, so the, the idea here is to create an ecosystem of smaller companies, and I think we have several high-quality companies that are internationally competitive, and this will function around the uh, two large shipyards. So that in the future, uh, or to put it differently, let's say, let's hope this will be the last time that uh, will be uh, French frigates that Greece, by necessity, was a, a customer, a buyer only. Uh, we hope to be partners uh, in future programs. And here comes the European dimension, whether this is the European Corvette or other naval construction programs. Uh, we want to be partners to the extent that our capabilities allow, but this is, uh, this is the future. Um, and, and hopefully we will, we will work together with our partners and create the conditions uh, for doing that. Um, so, um, it, it, it let me uh, finish this, this introductory uh, comments by, by saying that uh, the uh, security environment in the Mediterranean several uh, sea lines of communications and uh, we have uh, Gibraltar, Suez, 
the straits of all those choke points and, and its importance in the context of the strategic interest of several important countries plus uh, global trade. Uh, and let me also remind all of us uh, the Belgian Road is, is just one leg is, is crossing the Mediterranean. So the importance, the strategic importance uh, will remain high. Uh, the um, tension will not uh, be reduced anytime soon. So I will um, finish by again uh, echoing the Admiral. I think the only choice we have as Europeans uh, is more cooperation. Um, it, even the biggest European countries are small by global standards. Uh, so the only way to be taken seriously uh, in, in the strategic chessboard is to work much more closely with each other. Okay. Thank you very much for this introduction, which uh, I think will uh, invoke uh, many questions from the audience later on. But before we do that, I would like to give the floor to Professor Evangelos Ristoforo, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, he is the a professor, the professor at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the National Technical University of Athens. And he's also the director of the Sensors Laboratory. He works in the field of sensor design, development, characterization, and use particularly in magnetic, acoustic, and optical sensors for several applications, but also defense applications, of course. And I'm very uh, honored to mention that he is at the top 2% of scientists, according to the Stanford statistics. Um, so it is uh, with a high level of anticipation, Professor, that we uh, await your uh, introductory remarks, uh, after which we go to the Q&A session. Uh, I think the presentation okay. So you, you will allow me to stand up. Yeah, you can stand here if you like. And there it is. Yes, okay. You can click forward with this and there's a laser. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, um, today I want to present uh, a technology that has been developed by our laboratory concerning the the residual stress and plastic deformation uh, determination monitoring um, distribution also in order to know the uh, moment, okay, in order to know the moment of uh, uh, steel failure in, uh, in steel structures, including um, steel production and manufacturing process. Um, actually, the difficulty in this uh, particular um, uh, sensing challenge is the disability of monitoring residual stress distribution um, in the field. The actual technology that is able to provide um, um, stress monitoring is uh, first uh, the X-ray diffraction bracket that I set up and for surface characterization, and second, uh, neutral diffraction for um, bulk residual stress determination. Both are impossible to be done in the field. Really impossible because we cannot uh, do a laboratory measurement and the nuclear uh, uh, process in the, in the field. Therefore, um, the existing technologies in the field of stress monitoring are only the well-known strain gauges and uh, the drill hole setup. I will try to be uh, fast, not to disturb you too so many uh, technicalities, uh, and I will go straight to the fact that we want to use we want to use a magnetics technology since the steel is a uh, magnetic material. We want to use the self-embedded nanosensors self-embedded in the steel structure named uh, magnetic domain walls. 
since their movement, uh, let's say, uh, is the, the, main, uh, the main mechanism of magnetization process. And in the presence of any defect, you can detect such a defect by the magnetization process. So, what we have done <clears throat> is that we have developed certain coupons made of uh, autogenously welded samples, samples, steel samples of different actual samples, and therefore we generated different levels of stresses, of residual stresses there. Then um, we characterized the surface residual stresses and the bulk residual stresses by using X-ray fragment nano setup and neutral diffraction. I will not go in details on that. It's, it's a technical uh, matter, and um, we have developed it with respect to um, several trials in the beginning. And just the last uh, 10 years, we were able to actually achieve a monotonic and very small uncertainty induced measurements of residual stresses either in the surface or in the bulk of the material. Then, the same thing we have done for neutron diffraction for bulk residual stress monitoring. And uh, since we now know the stress distribution of these uh, residual stresses on the steel, we use uh, magnetic methods in order to monitor magnetic characteristics. These magnetic properties are uh, first of all, non-linear, and uh, we actually measure permeability, magnetic permeability, differential permeability, we measure Parkhausen noise, and we also employ non-linear magnetoacoustics. I have to say that uh, the main competitor of the magnetics technology is the non-linear acoustics technology. For this reason, uh, we actually included uh, the magnetostrictive delay line uh, method of, of, of monitoring the residual stresses in order to compare the two main mechanisms of stress monitoring, magnetic properties and magnetoelastic properties. And in what we have completed on is uh, depicted very well, I think, in this, uh, in this graph. You can see that uh, uh, these graphs actually concern the distribution of residual stress measurements uh, demonstrated by points. You see, there are some points on these three um, graphs representing the um, representing the welding area. So the fusion zone, the heat affected zones, the same in this in, in this stuff, and uh, the dots represent the actual residual stress measurements by either um, X-rays for the surface or by neutrons, neutron diffraction for the bulk. Um, the continuous lines represent the magnetic permeability and other magnetic properties. You can see how nicely the magnetic measurements are in agreement with the, the residual stress reference method of measurement. Therefore, we can use the magnetic characteristics or the magnetoelastic characteristics as the transfer standard for monitoring the residual stresses in the field. And actually, uh, uh, bearing, oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, bearing in mind this pair of values, we can, we can generate, let's say, what we call magnetic stress calibration curves corresponding, each one of them corresponding to each different type of, of speed. Therefore, we have actually um, targeted 42 different types of steels, which are the most important steels for the naval industry, for ship industry, for um, railways, automotive industry, etc. And uh, up to this moment, we have tested 17 different kinds of steel, and all of them are um, 
show the, showing a monotonic dependence of stress on magnetic properties, magnetic and magnetic elastic properties. Um, furthermore, I have to say that uh, um, all these curves, if uh, normalized with respect to the yield point of each spin and the maximum amount of the magnetic property under measurement, result in a universal law. This means that all masks, all magneto magnetic uh, stress calibration curves um, collapse into one single universal dependence of magnetic properties on, yet on, on, on residual stresses. What does it mean practically, apart from a good publication? This means that uh, if you have an unknown type of steel, the only thing you, you need to do is to monitor the yield point, the point where the plastic deformation starts. And therefore, you can tell for an unknown type of steel the amount of residual stress and the distribution of these of this residual stresses on the steel, predicting thus the actual uh, time and space where the crack will, will be. Um, Apart from that, we have also worked on the plastic deformation issues uh, using actually the magnetostricted delay line principle, the magnetoelastic properties, where we work above the yield point in order to monitor any kind of plastic deformation existing in the material. Um, we have uh, tested this technology in uh, different industrial applications. We are proud to say that uh, we determined not only the um, stress distribution in pipelines. This example I, I show here is from uh, Corinth Pipeworks, group of Biocalco. Um, Biocalco entrusted us in um, monitoring the, their production line and their quality control lab. And we are proud to say that uh, we are faster than the existing methods of uh, the kind of bridge transition um, um, uh, measurements, as well as we are precise in determining the points where the wells are not good enough and need further, uh, further um, treatment. Um, apart from that, uh, we worked in Munich in uh, trip steel evaluation of uh, Mercedes cars concerning trip steels. Um, which is the, uh, one of the best types of steels for, uh, um, for automotive industry. And we have also worked to, together with ABS, American Bureau of Shipping, uh, concerning the determination of the health of shafts and hull in, the, in, in ships. Um, this was not enough for us, because we wanted to not only monitor the residual stresses and therefore the possibility of cracking, by wood, but we wanted to correct such, such possibility, I mean, to, to return back the health of the steel. And we wanted to do that using not uh, the, the classical thermal treatment, but localized thermal treatment. And we did that with respect to induction heating. So we developed special types of um, of, of, of probes, let's say, of inductive probes, in order to obtain um, 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 residual stress annihilation. And uh, these inductive methods um, here are, are in principle used as depicted in these three following slides. First, we detect where the crosses are, let's say, we detect the residual stress um, um, in you know, existence, um, imperfection. Then we apply inductive heating in these positions, and if needed, we apply also quenching techniques, I mean, not only to annihilate the stresses, but also to, to, to replace them in the, in, the proper, in the proper level. And then we, we monitor again the stresses and we find them, I mean, in a, in a good position, let's say. Uh, an example for that has been done in the laboratory and performing uh, tests um, using um, induction heaters developed uh, either bought from the uh, uh, market or uh, developed by us. So, 
uh, you can see here that uh, um, using using permeability measurements, a simple permeability sensor, and hammering still in different positions result in a decrease of permeability, as you can see in this slide. Then, by applying heating here, by localized heating, not, not heating in all over the steel, uh, results in a coming back, let's say, or sort of coming back, of the permeability. Which means that the residual stresses uh, have been released in both cases. Uh, similarly, using the magneto restrictive delay line principle, um, uh, we use different, different actually methods of monitoring the magnetoelastic waves, the nonlinear acoustics, um, and then you can see how nicely these three, these two different points, the same two different points of hammering as I mentioned before, have been corrected um, um, as depicted in this uh, in this picture in this uh, slide. Uh, I would like to finalize. Sorry for taking so long. Um, uh, I would like to finalize this uh, short presentation by saying that the residual stress monitoring, the residual stress distribution monitoring, has been realized in the real field, in the, in factories, in industry, in ships, in uh, in cars, uh, meaning that we are in, in a technical readiness level. Seven. The actual rehabilitation of stresses has been done only in the laboratory, um, so the technical readiness level of this rehabilitation process at this moment is at between three and four. I would say. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Well, um, the range of subjects couldn't be more diverse, I would say. Um, I was afraid uh, you were losing me in your last presentation, but I understand correctly, I have a very old Peugeot 205, it is dented, I bring it to you, and you restore it to perfect conditions. Please. Okay. <laughs> and then you have the test subjects. I, I, I have to say that I love two pipes, especially especially the GPI one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just a practical example, but um, the way we want to proceed is to uh, engage in the uh, development discussion. And for that, uh, if you will forgive me, I have prepared uh, first a question for the Admiral, um, because Admirals like questions, I know from experience in the Netherlands. <laughs> And uh, for you, um, you mentioned uh, European cooperation, I hope. Yes. Uh, PESCO is one of them. It's, it's, uh, it's an important uh, tool as well for, for nations, for member states. And uh, in that uh, PESCO project, it is stated that OCAR is the preferred manager for organization. Um, we see that back in uh, several initiatives like the IDP and the EDF, etc. But um, Opera has also been requested to manage the well-known European Control Corvette program. Um, how do you think OCAR can help deliver capabilities to nations faster and more efficiently than the efficient way in which you're already operating? Because time is of the essence. Thank you for the question. Okay, as you said, PESCO was the tool very good tool to uh, foster the cooperation among uh, the nations and therefore among the uh, industries. And the PESCO defined OCAR as the uh, preferred manager for the problems. We already work in this contest with Europe. Before EDF, there was EDIP. And in the EDIP arena, we uh, have two programs that we cooperate with uh, the Commission. One is uh, the Eurogroup, and I have to say that the Eurogroup just started the 24th of uh, uh, last February, I signed the contract. Now Japan wants to participate first as observer with good possibility to become a participating state, and this is great. Then uh, we have ESSO, uh, the new uh, waveform for 
interoperability. There are six nations together, and also here uh, uh, the Commission participates. The money that they put, uh, of course, is uh, irrelevant to the big program. For Eurogroup, for example, they participated with 100 million out of the 7.1 billion program, and 37 uh, million out of altogether 800 million for ESO. So this to, to the tool of PESCO and the, the practical uh, delivery of money due to first the EMP and now the EF is for sure something that should be fostered in cooperation. Then I come to the second question. But uh, what I want to highlight uh, is that uh, EDF put on the table 8 billion to be used for cooperative programs. But today, there is a kind of uh, uh, assault to, the, to this money. Every nation tries to, to get as much as they can with as, as many programs as possible, which is not the spirit of the EF. The EF is to define programs and to have nations that cooperate with them, to have some money in order to foster these nations to work together, and then the nations have to get the money money for it. So this is something that the Commission and the nation have to work on. Then there is EPC. EPC is another PESCO program that is inside the EDF. OCA was chosen to manage this program. And the EPC is a potential uh, uh, cooperative uh, uh, nation in the program, not yet, because now we have only uh, Italy, uh, France, uh, Spain, but the potential is Greece and then Denmark and Norway. The other question was uh, how can we speed up this process? The time is fundamental, it's essential, particularly today. Yes, it's right. I fully agree with this definition. OCA, thanks to the very flexible management, can speed up the processes a lot. Once the nations make up their mind to cooperate, to create the same operational requirements, or at least similar operational requirements. Because operational requirements is tied up to the assets that you are going to use. If you decide to launch a missile in the space, or just at 40 kilometers is the different pressure requirements. And therefore, it is fundamental that the nations agree on this. But the nation agree on this according to the uh, input coming from the uh, industries. And here we come to what uh, uh, sorry, I don't know, uh, Mr. Uh, Thomas, uh, Mr. Thomas said uh, about the uh, capabilities of the, uh, of the industries. I personally believe a lot in the small and medium enterprises. Greece has a lot of them. We already work with some of them. For example, the Tiban. They are not going to go. But they are working with us, even though Greece is not yet a, a participant in the state program, but in the United Nations capabilities, they are doing a great job. And uh, therefore, everybody has to put on the table the best they can do. Not necessarily they have to be all tasks, fortunately, because otherwise there is a war. But uh, if, uh, if Greece or Belgium have a, a good, small, and medium enterprise can uh, work, can help the project, because at the end of the day, the real technology is there because they invest. This is the big difference. The small and the medium enterprise, they invest a lot because, of course, they are the issue to competition. Once this is agreed, who does what, then it is my problem. And uh, uh, in this case, I can tell you very clearly that we deliver the time. We have uh, problems, of course all the programs. 
Mr. Kern was uh, uh, discussing uh, about, uh, about uh, the armed vehicles, you know, the uh, balance box program. The boxer that is uh, the vehicle mostly uh, used in the world today. There are something like 200 to 2,500 uh, vehicles around. And for example, in Lithuania, that is one of the participating states, we have some problems, not matter of course, but the reaction that the contract authority, which means open in this case, the reaction is immediate. It's not, you don't even have to go around you know, the bureaucracy that the nation said. So we can, for sure, help a lot in speeding up the processes, in delivering in time. Uh, of course, when I say in time, I refer also to and the cost. You know very well that when you develop something, you start with X and then you, you, you do X plus Y plus Z as mine. So it is our responsibility to control the expenses. Thank you. Dr. Douglas, this must be music to your ears. Small and medium sized enterprises are reasonably part of the big problem. And you were referring to the wish of having more Greek industry participating in European projects. Does it answer your question? Well, it certainly does. Um, this is the only contribution we can have. Unfortunately, we're not one of the big industrial powers of the EU. We cannot compete with uh, and Kay or other big European companies that we can be complementary. Uh, and, and this is the only way forward. Again, we uh, lost valuable time. Um, consolidation at the national, but also the European level, should have taken place years ago. Uh, but it's, it's never too late. So for Greece, this is an absolute priority. How to support our small and medium enterprises uh, in uh, participating in European projects, be that TESCO or um, programs at, at the uh, national level, uh, consortium between several European countries. Uh, this is the only way forward. This is going to help us develop our, our industry. This is going to bring economic benefits. This is going to, and, and this is, I suspect, not just a good problem. It's, it's a high priority uh, for Greece. How to bring back all those talented young people that we lost during the economic crisis, all to, to invest the brain drain. And, and the only answer here is to create uh, well-paid jobs so that people can come back. Uh, and, and this is going also to help our national defense uh, achieve the necessary level of support for, its, for, for the equipment we're using. So it's a one-way street for us. Yes. If I can uh, uh, compare a little bit, uh, you talked before about uh, uh, the FBI ships in France and uh, the corvettes in the future. This morning I was I was discussing with uh, the minister, and uh, I said very clearly the uh, the, the way the, the good road to go to achieve what you said is. Uh, to be part of. And I agree. And for example, I said if you work with the Nova Group, if you may get whatever it is, the deal must be to work together. In other words, the, the big deal must be okay, what are you going to do? What I am um, gaining from this? What is the technology that comes back to me that will foster my small and uh, medium enterprise to develop new devices. The professor made something in terms of in terms of technical, so that so I understood it. not much, but I understand that one thing that there is a lot that can be can be developed again, can be possible. So it's fundamental not to buy. The word I buy a ship is wrong, in my opinion. Uh, to be partner, to develop together the devices, which does not mean necessarily diameter, but to good ideas. This is the way that all Europe can grow in different levels, but we can grow. Professor, I saw your hand. Yes. Um, I would like to give you to give an example of how uh, the technology developed 
by Greek academia, Greek research centers, can be used in, um, in developing, let's say, issues. Uh, what I presented here is what is that you can measure the quality of the steel, of the, of the structure of the, of the ship, actually, yeah? and uh, how you can correct this, uh, this, this structure. Um, this technology has been developed in, uh, in MPUA in, in Greece, and uh, at this moment, it has been given, actually, to a startup an SME named Sotiria Technologies that is exclusively collaborating with our laboratory in order to um, promote the technology in the real industry. Okay? So, this is an, a, a real exam example how the technology generated in Greece can be transformed in uh, other partners, in, in, the, in the Greek the, um, frigate and, uh, and uh, I mean, shipyards in general, by developing robots for welding, which do not exist even in the, in the large um, uh, ship developers, yeah, uh, builders, uh, that can be actually um, a Greek technology improving the quality of the ships developed, not bought, as you very well said, uh, in Europe. Greece develops the technology used by all Europe in this field. And this is not done by the university, it's impossible, yeah. but it's done via an SME which is willing to use the technology for the defense industry. Professor, one plus one sometimes is four. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What, what, what I feel in your reaction excuse me for the word feel, is that you are looking to advertise the knowledge that you have, and it's very deep and impressive knowledge, for it to be exploited in future projects and in future European cooperation. Would it be fair to say, and this was a question I had in my mind preparing for this session, that Greece needs, in order to be a more mature partner for other programs, a sort of a triple helix of cooperation where your knowledge lands in exactly the right place. For example, the arms directorate or at the strategic level, so that it can be taken into consideration when dealing with other nations. Is that fair to say? It's absolutely, it's absolutely correct to, to say that. And uh, I, I, I hope that in the next, uh, uh, next, next month, let's say, the next weeks possibly, uh, we are going to demonstrate the technology in some uh, leading um, ship uh, producers and manufacturers, and including um, actually uh, naval um, uh, shipyards, I mean, shipyards like uh, European uh, shipyards, in order to, to demonstrate the technology and uh, being also standardized via the uh, electrical and uh, um, and metallurgical uh, societies of standardization. Okay, thank you very much. Well, this is a point where you are going to be involved in the discussion, I believe. Yes, sir. Question for the Admiral. Uh, you said cooperation is the key word for your organization. In the real world, what is the focus of relations with uh, the companies in Israel? with the companies, the individual companies in Europe. Um, and it is a smooth cooperation. What is your experience so far uh, from uh, the projects you have uh, already been? Okay. I confirm that cooperation is a key word because cooperation means also interoperability. We did not mention interoperability, but without interoperability, the allies, they don't talk to each other, okay? So, this is, uh, what is uh, my experience uh, for this? Okay, as I said before, before I start uh, managing a, a program through a contract, for me it's fundamental to define three aspects. One is cost, the second one is the uh, schedule, okay? And the third one is the uh, harmonization of the uh, operation requirements. Once we have done it, we have to 
during the negotiation with the prime contractors, we try to understand who can do what. Okay? This is the key point. Because if uh, the uh, Airbus, for example, from Eurodome, they give everything to the big industries, they don't consider also the, the, the second, the third, the fourth tier of uh, uh, you know, the subcontractors or the small and medium enterprises, then something is wrong. So, what we control as OCA is that this cascade uh, arrives in the right way. Then we check on the, on the companies if they are really able, if they have the expertise, if they have the knowledge, the know how to do this kind of development. This is what I can do. But remember, the responsibility at the end remains the prime contractor. For us, it's fundamental to check, to control. I give you an example. Uh, Eurodrome. Uh, Airbus has the responsibility to launch a competition for the motors. Okay? And there were two companies. One was the Safran from France, and the other one was the Avio from uh, Italy. Okay? At the end of the game, for many reasons that I'm, I'm not going to talk here, uh, Airbus decided to go with uh, Avio. We had a very incredible and tough reaction from France, accusing that this is uh, because you know Avio is owned by GE, but Avio is Italian. Uh, they, they, they deserve uh, um, either uh, components and so forth. We checked, we controlled. At the end, I said, no, everything is okay. This is what we do. In that case, we safeguard the company who won the competition and the competences are all there. So this is our job. Okay. Please uh, introduce yourself and say where you work Thank you. I'm Vice Admiral of Marcus. Carlos Marcus on the other panels here. Hello, colleague. I will ask you a basic question for saying okay. Okay, is the uh, European Union's uh, body part? No. no. We are talking about the European Union. It's uh, the institution that we all participate. And we have the European Defense Agency. What was the real need to create OCA? It was the initiative of four, three, five uh, countries on bilateral uh, relations. And why continue to accommodate the European Defense Agency to overcome difficulties and to expand and to have under control if we act as Europeans, as European Union? Okay. Uh, same question. And someone would ask who uh, gets the benefits from our country? Who wins? I, I mean, uh, with industry. And I have a question also for Mr. Focus. In order to, to have a solid uh, defense and industrial European basis, do you consider that the business state first as a priority uh, to have a political integration with the European Union in order to have a common foreign policy and identify uh, common uh, European Union's interests in order to, uh, to develop all the necessary means, including hard power, to become a security provider, or we shall continue for the next case to, to discuss and um, what like us to do today. Thank you very much. That will first, and yes, of course. OCA was born much earlier than Europe, okay? Because uh, the declaration was made in 1993, and uh, the principles were made in 1995 by Chirac and Co. OCA has nothing to do under this aspect as management of big programs with the uh, EDA and uh, Commission. They have different jobs. This is important. You say, why OCA? That was not your first question. Because OCA exists. And OCA is an organization 
in the European vocation, European vocation. And it was absolutely European before the Brexit. Now we have UK inside. But this is not an invitation at all, because our uh, organization is such that the programs are inside the program divisions. I should have brought the presentation, but I, I, I hope you can understand. The program divisions, where there is a program manager who is fully endorsed by me, and all the national sensitive items are inside the program division. So there is no possibility that, 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 that an external can put the eyes. But if UK wants to participate to a program that is European, the nations will decide yes or not. And if it's yes, it is an, an added value. OCA has only six member states plus eight participating states are becoming 11 participating states, so we are unfortunately growing and growing. But having only six member states, you can understand that the decision-making process is much faster than European, where they are to examine. But all the other European nations, they can participate, to, of course, in the programs, where they have the same benefits of the member states in the program. So why Oka? Because Oka is uh, flexible. I, I talk about the speed of decision making. It's, uh, it's very, very fast. It's not like international administrations. Why not the Commission? The Commission is not uh, the, the, the DigiTeps. It's not organizing for managing programs. It's organizing for, let's say, the better word distributing demand, but it's not like that. It's more, of course, to, to choose uh, programs that should be uh, partially uh, funded by, by, by Europe. So, DG Davis cannot manage program. EDA. EDA was, was worked for the institute of any program, for the harmonization of operation requirements, for technological research, which is much different from the development, production, and support to a management approach. Always, everybody, that was another question from, from you. Everybody, Ocar, because it grows, it becomes stronger, and more knowledge, more know-how, and so forth. Nations, because they have the delivery in time, in performance, and in cost. And Europe, in this case, because if we do that, if we, could, we do cooperative, cooperative programs, Europe has reached their own goal. Okay? Dr. Douglas, the second part of the question was about the European political integration. Well, this is a legitimate question. Basically asking, should we uh, try to avoid putting the cart in front of the horse? Um, and I think it's fair to say, uh, many of us have been critical of the EU uh, for not doing enough in the field of foreign policy, uh, defense, and security. But I think over the past five years, um, and after missing several opportunities, uh, there is noticeable movement uh, in that sector. The EU has taken a number of decisions, has created institutions and funds um, to, to work together uh, in the defense sector. Now, uh, have we done all that we can? Obviously not. Um, and if we move from the capabilities to the will to use them, that will be another huge step, which we're not, I think, ready to take at this stage. But having said that, and because, as they say, politics is the art of the feasible, I think uh, we should uh, take for granted that there is political will for uh, defense consolidation, and we should continue taking or making small steps one after the other in moving in the right direction. Uh, and and you know, I, I suppose the only thing we can do uh, after that is to hope that our political masters uh, will make the real uh, difficult decisions when the time comes. Another question. 
uh, Jay Marble of Senior Research Global, uh, for Professor Stockwell. Um, thank you for your, your research. Uh, very interesting. Can you give me a number from one to ten on the significance of the uh, results that uh, you showed? Often uh, we, we measure stress and strain, or at least image stress and strain, through uh, a synchrotron, which is a, a large uh, facility. Can your your methods be used uh, beyond what a uh, synchrotron could provide? Um, okay. Thank you very much for the question. Um, first of all, um, using um, the proper um, sources for XRD and the proper array detectors for detecting diffraction, then uh, we are trying to approach the response of synchrotron. Um, besides, um, neutron diffraction can do things better something in thick steel samples. So, um, uh, if you want, uh, we, we are also trying to get uh, an access to synchrotron in order to, to uh, um, observe similar things like what we observe in uh, X rays and neutron diffraction. Um, if you, need, if you want an answer of so from a cost perspective, your method is going to be orders of magnitude more affordable than using it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, in, in fact, we have seen such a response, uh, such a, um, a good agreement with, um, with uh, measurements in, in using also um, artificial intelligence algorithms according to which we predict at the time of Stress uh, of steel failure, which is an agreement with the real, the real thing happening. Um, Simplotron is expensive. Our calibration technology is not expensive. The sensors is the important thing that are not expensive and can be um, real time used. I mean, the speed of measurement is uh, uh, in the order of one meter per, uh, per second which is really fast with respect to the other technologies. And more important is that the rehabilitation methods are, are really um, helpful in terms of localized, uh, localized um, rehabilitation or relation stresses. By all means, uh, a, a comparison with synchron is, is is good to, to, to be done. But for samples up to a given thickness. Um, if you want an answer from 0 to 10, <laughs> I'm not the right guy to, to give such an answer, but I, I would say seven. <laughs> by means of not losing something by the neutral diffraction in, uh, in depth, and by not, and not losing information for, for surface stress measurement. However, the seven and not nine or nine and a half comes because the uh, neutral diffraction is a rather average in the, in the thickness, in the whole thickness. Whereas using other techniques can provide stress depth distribution also, which is one of our targets together with superior technologies in this field. Is sufficient? Souls to the gentleman in third row. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Stavros Perez from the University of Macedonia here in Greece. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Tokos uh, on the keynote session we had uh, Mr. Stewart that said about uh, testing new technologies and preparing, preparing leasing over buying. Uh, what would be Greece's position? Obviously, we have major gaps in Navy and uh, Army, but uh, we will be open to more leasing rather than buying and testing the new technologies. Thank you. That's not a question I expected, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure to what extent uh, leasing applies to um, the defense sector, whether we can actually lease 
major equipment. Uh, but if you manage to convince me that the cost would be lower and the speed of delivery would be higher, I suppose our military experts uh, would be ready to discuss the idea. So it's on the table. <laughs> and I have another question. Hello, I'm Georgios Kukais from the Hellenic Institute for Strategic Studies. One question for Mr. Thanos uh, Lokos and one for Gatra. It's on the same uh, page. Uh, on March 2022, the European Union endorsed the strategic compass, which sets a time frame from several goals towards a European defense independence. For Mr. Dobos, how possible do you think is a European army for the next decade uh, to be created? And how will this affect uh, the work of offer? Or, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, that's a nice dream, but I'm afraid it will um, remain a dream for, for the next several years. Um, and, and when we actually talk about the European defense capability, I think there's a major stumbling block, uh, and I haven't heard any, any quite good ideas on how to get around it. And this is that we spent uh, 27 times uh, money for the uh, for doing the same jobs and 27 separate national defense budgets. Now, if somehow we were able to pull that money together and, uh, and, and use it for developing a, a single defense capability we would make significant progress. That would be, I think, the second largest defense budget in the world after the, the US. Uh, but unfortunately, no one has thought of any ways to go around it. So I guess we'll continue to spend, to have 27 separate military uh, defense budgets uh, in, in you know, duplicating or what is the number for 27 times doing the same things. And, and that's a major problem. But again, I, I don't want to, um, to say that nothing has been achieved. And you mentioned the strategic compass. Uh, whatever criticisms one may have, that was, that was yet another step. Uh, so we have done a number of things over the past few years. Uh, there is a roadmap. It's, we're still in the early uh, stages, uh, and there is a long way ahead, but we are moving. I, I would keep that as the important thing. The EU is moving. It may take us time. And unfortunately, these are not laboratory conditions. So maybe uh, the world around us and the threats are moving at a faster pace, and we need to catch up. So it's at least we. Final remark, I fully agree with you, doing that. But one day, maybe it becomes true. Uh, how can I affect talk at this? Of course, by definition, I talk to because OCA is a, an organization for cooperation. So if there is no cooperation, it's a tough road to manage problems. So that's why we are struggling also to try to help the nations to converge to the same operational requirements and later on in a fair distribution of the work. The strategic combat talks about the European independence. And the, the words are fantastic. Because today, unfortunately, we are not independent. We follow the US. Okay? We follow NATO, which is fine because the US is not fundamental for the for the Europe for everyone. But for something like Southeast and uh, of Europe, the problems that we have, uh, Europe should be more independent. But to be more independent means that it has to be united. Means that we have to, as I said before, interoperate with each other, and we should have the same assets to use. In this case, we are a little more, we are a little freer with the Americans. If you look at the Afghanistan, the Iraq, we did what the Americans did first. They decided to go, we went. They decided to withdraw, we withdraw, we withdraw. So Europe is not yet, 
but you know, I want to keep the positivity of the, of the Mr. Mr. Dover, uh, of course. Uh, I am, uh, you know, I want to share the, the optimism of Mr. Dover because uh, we must move. We are moving a little bit too slowly today. But the problem is not Mr. Borrell. The problem is not a strategic compass because it was agreed by everybody. The problem is that some nations have to understand that we have to interoperate, we have to cooperate. And to cooperate means that I have to look, to, to leave something to the others in order to have a Europe. I was not a Europe. Well, we have time for one very short question because we have one minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Colin Jones, retired. Taking uh, the floor after the last point that uh, different countries, different armies have different requirements, uh, operational requirements. What's the case behind we don't proceed with a firefighting aircraft inside Europe? All the South Europe is suffering every summer. Why we don't proceed and we just rely on a Canada or 50 year design aircraft to fight our fires? Do you have an answer? I have an article two months ago, but no answer. Nobody, you know, takes any step. Thank you. Well, I can give you my answer, which does not mean that is the, the truth of 100%. I agree with you. We should not develop two fighters. It's impossible. We will never apply. As I said before, there are 400 billion euros to be to them. But the problem is that we have on one side F gas. The French and France leading. We're talking about firefighting aircrafts. Firefighting. Ah, Canada. Yes. I, Why don't uh, proceed with a new aircraft, European aircraft, to fight the fires, the wildfires, that destroy Europe? The, well, this is a very good question, but I would ask this question to Europe, to, to the European Commission. I, I, I don't know why we never, we have never been never involved in this. Uh, uh, in the subject, but uh, conceptually, I agree with you. I agree with you for uh, firefighting. Uh, fire we uh, everybody has one different. They don't do it. But the problem is, do they have uh, this program in Pesco? Do is uh, the European Commission going ahead to choose one for all? I don't think so. To be honest, otherwise I would have known. I think they take the vacations from the south of Europe, so they can see the fires. I think we have to conclude with this. It's a very good question and a relevant one, but it's not second pillar. So that's, I think that's where the problem lies. But I want to conclude this session on a positive note, thanking the three esteemed colleagues and uh, excellent keynote speakers for their efforts. Thank you very much for coming here and uh, for addressing this very complicated subject uh, so eloquently. So thank you, Professor, Dr. Admiral, and a big hand for Paul speech. There's now coffee 30 minutes after that we come back in our separate sessions.